Today, we move into kind of the final phase of the book of Ephesians, kind of this final last hurrah of what the Apostle Paul wants to instill and impress upon the church in Ephesus so that they might transition from walking with Jesus in all of the areas of life that Jesus has called them to walk with him to standing firm against evil. He transitions from walking with Jesus in various realms, whether that be with your new life that you have just found in Christ, or walking with Jesus in your marriage, or in your family, or in your work, now to transitioning to saying, in order to stay in your walk with Christ, you need to know a few things about your enemy. You need to know a few things, a few clear, important things about the one who wants to destroy you, who wants to make your witness ineffective, and the one who wants to derail your life and the life of his church. Uh, If you were here last week, you you heard Pastor Glenn kind of close up this walking with Jesus section in talking about walking in your work as an employee. And yes, I specifically gave him the text to walk as an employee. (laughs) And he did an absolute fantastic job. And as you were listening to him and hearing him preach, I'm sure everybody finally, collectively had a sigh of relief saying, oh, he's good. He's really good. Praise the Lord. And we are just so thankful that God has called, uh, has called Pastor Glenn and the Bakel family to come serve alongside of us in helping us kind of fill out what God has called us to do here. And it's a really, oppor- it's really strategic timing for the Bakel family to come because we are experiencing some amazing growth. Praise God. Uh, summer is usually the time when people kind of ditch out on church. Uh, they, there's many other things that people can be doing in their downtime, whether it's heading to the lake or going on vacations or doing various things. But from last year to this year, our worship service attendance is up 12%. Praise the Lord. And, and of that growth of worship service attendance, we have seen an increase in kids' ministry in particular of 36%. So not only are we growing in attendance, but we're growing with the little ones who are coming to learn more about Jesus and be trained and equipped for what it means to be a follower of Jesus, even as little kids. So that makes it a very strategic opportunity for us as we move into this new season of growth and ministry. Uh, But it's also going to serve for us as a warning for what we're talking about today. Because we have an enemy who hates what's going on here. We have an enemy who hates the fact that people are coming to know the Lord. We have an enemy who hates the very idea that people want to worship Jesus and grow in their faith in him and be strengthened by his power. We have an enemy who absolutely hates that and has our church in his crosshairs because God is working, God's love is being adorned here. So what we're talking about both this week and for the next two weeks is very important to understand how to stay on course as we face opposition from our adversary. If you want the entire message in just kind of one sentence so that you can lodge it into your brain, the the, the message is this. uh, Following Jesus, following Jesus strengthens us to stand firm against evil. Following Jesus strengthens us to stand firm against evil. And we're going to see two specific commands coming from the Apostle Paul that will help strengthen us so that we might stand firm when opposition comes. So if you have your Bible, uh, please uh, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10. Through 12. Finally, the Apostle Paul says, finally, after all that has been said, finally, be strong in the Lord 
and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I pray now, as we are gathered here together as your church, that, that you would speak to us clearly, that you would help us to see the truth in your word, that you would clarify the gospel to us in such a way that we would be strengthened and equipped to face whatever the adversary throws at us, that we would not shrink back and hide from evil, but that we would be able to stand in your strength, in your full armor, being able and willing to engage even in spiritual warfare. Help us, O oh God. Strengthen us. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so this past week, uh, my, my family and I, we, we took a, a really quick trip to northern Wisconsin. It's the area of the country which I grew up going to in the summers. My, my parents would take us to, and we would have these large family gatherings in northern Wisconsin where, where we would connect with one another as a family. It was just a, a fun time of recreation. And my, my parents footed the bill, so we're like, we're there. <laughs> Uh, so we decided to go from Tuesday to Friday of this week. We hopped on the plane, went to northern Wisconsin, and one of the activities that we did with, all, with my mom, my dad, uh, all of my, uh, my ne nieces and nephews, my kids, my wife, uh, uh, one of my aunts and uncles were there, all of us kind of gathered together on one particular day, and we took a canoeing trip down the Brule River that feeds into Lake Superior. It was about a nine-mile journey that took about four hours to complete. Now, we had all different types of canoers, from people who are canoeing for the very first time to experienced canoers that have uh, canoed and backpacked and, and, and had a very, uh, has a lot of outdoor experience. And as we're canoeing down the Brule River for nine miles with a whole host of different types of people, we're going downstream. It's a nice leisurely activity. And I begin to think to myself, wow, this is so beautiful. This is so fun. This is so great. I am so glad we're not going the other direction. <laughs> There is no possible way with the experience uh, level of all of the different people that were in our group that we could have turned around and paddled upstream in our own strength for nine miles in one particular day. We were simply going downstream, we were steering, we were paddling every now and again, but it would have been nearly impossible for us with our strength and experience level to turn around and paddle upstream against the current. But if we take the scriptures seriously about what it talks about, about the state of this world and this present dark age and this present evil age that we live in, and we take that seriously and we take the calls to follow Jesus seriously, this is exactly what the New Testament asks us to do. Turn around, go against the spirit of this age, and paddle as hard as you can upstream. That's nearly impossible to do in our own strength. There's no possible way with the hodgepodge of different spiritual strengths that God has gathered together in his church that we could, as a people, genuinely, in our own strength, feel as if we could paddle a long distance against the current trajectory of our world. But that's exactly what the New Testament asks us to do. Go against the grain. Do not be conformed in the, to the pattern of this world, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How are we to do that? How are we to go against 
the thought patterns and direction of the culture of the world and head and towards Jesus and towards Christ. Well, Paul answers here in this final section in the book of Ephesians, and he says of this, finally, after everything that I've talked to you about walking with Jesus, after everything that I've said about this new life that you have in Christ, after everything that I've discussed with you about walking with Jesus in the various areas, finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Notice, he doesn't say, be strong in yourself and in the power that you have within you. Notice that he doesn't say, you can just pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and be strong enough to conquer this world in and of your own strength. He gives the, abs- he gives the source for where spiritual strength comes from. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In the strength of his might, that that phrase should clue, uh, that should turn light bulbs on in your head if you've been a careful reader of the book of Ephesians. He's used this phrase before, the strength of God's might in the past, and it should call to mind uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. In that passage, Paul is opening up the epistle to the church in Ephesus, and he's saying to them, he's praying for them, I pray that as you're reading this text, I pray that, that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you might know what is the immeasurable greatness of the power towards us who believe. He's praying that that the Christians in Ephesus might know and understand the immeasurable power of God. He's praying that they would be spiritually strengthened in their hearts as they are reading this epistle that he's writing to them. Now, that's great and wonderful language about talking about spiritual strength and spiritual power, but it's not rooted in anything concrete unless he defines a concrete reality. Unless he actually says what this power is, it's just like saying, go and be strong. Okay, well, be strong for what? And how am I supposed to be strong? Well, Paul doesn't leave us hanging in verse 20, in verse 20 of chapter 1. According to the working of his great might, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The power of the the power of God, the might of God, the strength of God is most clearly and concretely seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus, the perfect man, the perfect human who did not sin, went to the cross, went against the spirit of the age, took all of the sin of the world upon himself, went into the grave, buried all of that sin, and then three days later, God flexed his muscles in a heavenly bench press and raised Jesus higher than any authority, higher than any power, higher than anything else in all of existence. And Jesus, as I'm preaching, as you are sitting, as we are singing, is raised higher than anything else. And he sits on a throne in full glory and all of his strength, power, and glory ruling over his church, you and me. And when, you can give me an amen on that. (laughs) And when Paul roots back, goes back and says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, he's calling to mind the God that they are serving. He's calling to mind, you are worshiping the king who has overcome the grave. You are worshiping the God who has come as a man and has defeated sin and death in and of himself. The strength that you need to go against the grain of sin and death is not found in yourself. It's found on the throne. 
the strength that you need to lead your family, to go in the direction that God is calling you to go in, is not found within, it's found up in heaven. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might that is for every person who believes. What this means, the spiritual power that you need to stand in the strength of the Lord in opposition to sin and death and the evil one is the same power that has overcome the grave, the same strength that God gives to you by his spirit after you believe in Christ, that same strength that is the same strength that rose Jesus from the dead. And it is his spirit that's at work and alive in you, strengthening you to walk against the current and against the spirit of this age. Our strength to walk our strength to continue this journey towards heaven, it comes from his strength. The same strength that rose Jesus from the dead is at work within his church. The power you need to resist temptation, the power you need not to fall into that pattern of sin again and again, the power you need to think the thoughts of God and keep your mind focused on him and what he has for you is not from yourself, but it's from God and his spirit residing in you through faith. And it is yours. So when you're canoeing downstream and just enjoying a leisurely ride in the river, you're thinking to yourself, man, this is fun, and genuinely, it's a really fun activity. It's really fun until you realize the end. And if we're continuing the metaphor and continuing the image, the, the way that the Bible talks about the, the end of sin and the end of, of the world and the end of how God uh, puts all, of, all things right through his Son is that the end of sin and the end of death is destruction. For the wages of sin is death, the scriptures say. So sure, we can go along with the spirit of the age, we can go along with the trajectory of the world, and it might seem really fun. It might seem like a leisurely journey for 30, 50, 70, maybe even 100 years of saying, woohoo, this is great. But what we don't realize and what the evil one has done to our world is cast a cloud of thick fog of darkness so that we don't realize the end is a 30-foot cliff. And the carnage at the end is, is broken and destroyed lives that have rebelled against our Creator. And the conversion moment is when God as we're canoeing downstream, he realizes us, he gives us the map and says, danger, danger. If you continue to go in the direction that you're going, it leads to destruction. This current is taking you a place that, that you don't want to go eternally. And God awakens our souls. He shows us our, the end for which our de deeds deserve, and he allows us by his love and by his grace to turn and to head upstream, to journey towards him by the power of his grace and by the power of his cross. So what are the three, what are the ways in which you can be spiritually strengthened in your life to, to head upstream? First, is just to realize the, the end for which the stream is going. It's just to be awakened to the reality that, that this world is, is, is not going in a direction that is leading to eternal life. That the, the direction for humanity, if we are given over to ourselves and to our lusts and to our sinful desires, the end of that is destruction. Yeah, it might be fun for 10 years, it might be fun for five years, it might be fun for 50 years. But the end of all of that is, is going and moving in a direction towards destruction. And the first is just realizing that. Awakening to the reality that, that God describes the world in a much different way. That rebellion against him isn't fun or cute. 
it's, heading, it's, it's sending, us, send, sending us headlong in a direction that's apart from him. And the first thing we need to do is just realize that this is the, this is the, the river that we're swimming in. And secondly, from that, and, and confess that and say, I, I no longer want to be a part of this. Don't want to continue down in that direction. I don't want to nurture those sinful, evil desires within me that I thought were fun at one time, but now I, I realize I need to head in a different direction. That's the first thing. It's called confession. It's called repentance. Looking to Jesus, trusting in him. And the second thing we need to do is just ask him for strength. Realize, I don't have the power within me to, to head upstream. Jesus, I need your power. Jesus, I need the power that, that raised you from the dead in order to start my journey against the trajectory of, of, of where my lusts and sins and flesh desire for me to go. And it's asking, God, fill me with your strength. God, fill me with your power that I might continue, that I might head upstream. And then secondly, just ask personally. And then thirdly, it's doing what you're doing this morning banding together with other brothers and sisters that are going in a direction towards heaven and leaning on one another and the strength that God provides for you through the help of other people and you're heading co collectively together towards Christ and towards his cross. Joining together with other Christians who will hold you accountable, will keep you going in the direction towards heaven that God has assigned for each one of us. Now that tells us how like, we can be strengthened spiritually to go in the direction that God desires for us. But it doesn't fully prepare us for what happens as we're heading up the river in our journey and we, we face a roadblock. Or worse than just a roadblock, we face opposition, loud voices, or perhaps even fully strengthened men or women that are standing in our way or beings that are standing in our way. And that's where the Apostle Paul goes in verses 11 and 12. And he gives this command. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. We can't stand against the roadblocks of evil on our journey without the armor of God's grace, the armor of the gospel. When Paul says, put on the whole armor of God or the full armor of God, he is saying from head to toe, your entire spirit, soul, mind, being, body, everything about yourself be covered in grace. Everything about your existence be covered in the strength of God's new identity that he has for you in Christ. Put your defenses fully in the grace of God in the gospel. Put on the whole armor of God. Why do we put on the whole armor of God? The full head-to-toe grace of God covering every part of our existence. Why do we put on the whole armor of God? Well, it tells us in order to stand against the schemes of the evil one. If you put on the partial armor of God, if you still have that area of your life that you're like, well, I need God's grace for my work life because, you know, I need a lot of forgiveness there. The way that I talk to my boss, yeah, I know that's not right. And I need grace there. But at home, I'm a champion. I'm a father. I'm a great father. Uh, my kids love me. My wife loves me. I don't need any of God's grace in that area of my life. That opens you up to the susceptibility of pride, which is one of Satan's favorite attacks. Yeah, you are pretty good, aren't you? Keep puffing yourself up. Yeah, you probably don't need God in that area. And puffing yourself up so the higher you get, the stronger and bigger your fall. And this is why Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Every facet of your life be bathed, be covered in the grace of God in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. The, the implication here is in your own strength, 
if you try to equip yourself with anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit of God, if you try to equip yourself in any other way, you will not be able to stand. He will find that chink in your armor, and you will fall. The only way to stand against the schemes of the evil one is to put on the full armor of God, head to toe, entirely covered by God's grace. But then notice he identifies the enemy. He identifies the enemy. Put on the whole armor of God in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul makes it abundantly clear who our enemy is in verse 12. Now, if you listen to political talk radio, go ahead, you can. Permission granted from your pastor. In moderation, almost everything is permissible. But if you take in a steady dose of political talk radio from the right or from the left, they feed and they fuel on trying to convince you that the real enemy is who? The other side. The opposing party. If you listen to one side for too long, you will believe that your real enemy is those who vote for the other guy or girl. Paul makes it abundantly clear who the real enemy is in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's a euphemism for humanity. We do not wrestle against humanity, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The battle for the Christian is not personal. It's not between human against human. It's between humans' souls against the evil one and his wicked system that tries to distract everyone from the grace of God and the gospel. Human beings are made in the image of God. If they are breathing, they are reflecting in some capacity the very image of their creator. If human beings are here and they're alive, they are made in the image of God. Yes, they might be deceived. Yes, they might be living out a sinful lifestyle. Yes, they might be propagating some ideas that are very counter-gospel that are going against the very trajectory of what God desires for them and for humanity. But let us make no mistake, they are not our enemy. They're deceived. Our enemy is the one who casts darkness over this world that prevents people from seeing the light of the gospel. People are either saved, rescued, redeemed by God's grace, or God is calling us as his people to go into this present darkness and shine the light of the gospel so that they might be redeemed, saved, and understand the true knowledge of God in the gospel. And until we get that biblical picture of humanity, we will only see other people who disagree with us as our enemies and not as people who God loves and desires to save by his grace. And the only way we will be able to enter into constructive dialogue and help people see the light of the glory of God and the gospel, if we are fully standing in the grace of God ourselves and able to engage in spiritual warfare, knowing that the battle is not with that person in particular, but the battle is against the spiritual beings who are casting darkness over, spiritual darkness over this world. Now let's imagine at night, one night, uh, my whole family is sleeping in our house and my daughter wakes us up in the middle of the night uh, and she says, one of my most valuable possessions is gone. My brother did it. And so we go into my son's room and we wake him up. Hey, son, 
did you take one of our dog, one of your sister's most valuable possessions? It's gone. And he says, no, I've been sleeping. And she says, no, he did it. I've seen him. He wants that particular possession. He wants it. He, he doubles down and he says, I was sleeping. I didn't do it. And she tr- continues to engage with him and says, or maybe he says something like, maybe he says, like, I've never taken any of your possessions ever. And then she says, well, you did take my soccer ball one time and play with your friends without asking. And then he says, well, I did that one time, but you forgave me for that, and I, and I haven't done anything else since, and I haven't done anything. The longer the fighting between my son and daughter happens, the longer that I don't step in as a father and say, you know what? The battle here isn't between you, you two, but there's an intruder who broke into our house who stole our valuable possession. The longer I just allow for the conversation between my son and daughter to continue, the longer the intruder can plan his next attack. And the more he can hide in the darkness, and the more he can hit up other houses in the neighborhood and steal their valuable possessions. But the sooner we identify there's a burglar, there's an intruder, There's someone who has come and robbed us. The quicker we can make a defense strategy, the quicker we can call the God-given authorities and say there's an intruder in the neighborhood, there's a burglar who has been stealing from houses, the quicker we can set up our security systems and so that we can prevent this from happening again. But so long as the brother and sister are continuing to fight, the intruder gets to go free. Brothers and sisters, this is what happens when we make enemies out of other image bearers of God. This is what happens even most exclusively in the church if we fight against one another. The enemy just gets to hide back in darkness and just laugh and say, see, this is what sin does, and I absolutely love it. Brothers and sisters, we do not need to be scared of Satan. We do not need to be scared of this present evil age. We just need to name who our real enemy is. And we need to go to battle against him by putting on the full armor, the full grace of God, and walking in the direction against the spirit of this age and toward heaven. We will receive enough opposition if we just simply do that. And rest assured that God's grace in the gospel is a far more superior defense system and attacking weapon against the forces of darkness than any of the schemes the evil one has, to, has against us. This is why David could slay Goliath. This is why Israel could put foreign armies to flight. This is why the church of Jesus Christ has gone into every culture on the planet and is able to preach the gospel and rescue people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language because the gospel is true, the gospel saves, and the gospel works. So let's close this thing down here by just stating the obvious. Some of us, some of us are still going down the current in the trajectory of the world, doing whatever our sinful hearts desire, and we think we're having fun, but the end is destruction and death. Today, God might be calling you to awaken to the reality that the trajectory for where you're headed is not where God desires for you to go. And if that's you here this morning, I need you to hear very clearly from me that God has grace in the gospel to turn your life around and head you in the direction that he has planned for you from before you were even born. And if you hear his voice tonight in the scriptures, know that you have a God who loves you, a God who sent his son to die for you a God who desires to give you new life and a family, and a new spiritual family that he desires for you to journey along with until he promotes you to glory. And if that is you, you can talk with myself or one of the shepherds after the service today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gospel. 
We thank and praise you that we have in the gospel everything that is needed to withstand the attacks of the evil one. God, help us to be able to identify our real enemy, the one who is deceiving the world and, and, and casting a thick, a thick darkness so that we might not see the light of Jesus. Help us as a people to be equipped to walk in your power, to be strengthened in your power, to receive your truth, to walk in your ways, God, we pray that the evil one would not have his way here at Sierra Bible Church, that we pray that we would not fight with one another, but that we would go to battle and war against our real enemy. Help us to be people of conviction and prayer, who seek your truth, who desire to walk in your way, and pray that the grace of the gospel would strengthen us to stand firm against evil. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.